Yes, um, I think that is a good amount. Okay, great, great. Um, hello, everyone. Um, we're so excited to have you here uh, for the next hour or so um, as part of our first um, colleague experience share uh, workshop. And um, today we're going to be talking about major donor stewardship in a virtual world. And I'm just so excited to welcome Ileana Rodriguez and Julia Pagan. With um, uh, Ileana's with NC Child, and Julia is with Our Children Oregon, as you can see from her beautiful background. Um, so we're going to get started in just a second, but I would like to give um, Debbie a moment to introduce this session if you'd like. I'd be delighted to. And I'm so happy that we have the ability to offer it. Um, you know, this is a really challenging time for all of us. You've probably heard the word challenging along with about 10 others we could all rattle off. And what we're trying to do is help you figure out how to learn from what is working in the network to strengthen your fundraising capacity. Um, you've probably all heard me say that one of the most important things for the partnership is making sure that you are not only financially stable, but also have enough unrestricted dollars to be able to do your lobbying work and to be able to work on whatever matters most to kids, regardless of whether you've gotten foundation resources for that. And if anything has demonstrated the importance of your being able to have enough funding on hand that you can deal with big new crises. I would think 2020 is the, the, the case study for it. Um, so I'm thrilled that we're doing this. I'm really eager to learn what people have done that's working. Um, I'm hoping that this will be the first in a series of conversations about what does and doesn't work. I know from some um, uh, other nonprofit um, kind of networks that I sit in on, just watch to see what's useful for the partnership, that some organizations have made fairly successful transitions to um, online learning and uh, online events and online fundraising. This call is obviously a little different because we're talking about major donors, but I do think that um, this is entirely possible. The only other thing that I will mention is that uh, Julia and I were just chatting about the fact that one of the many things the CARES Act did is it did um, increase the deductibility of the donations people make to you. And that actually may be something that you would wanna make sure you tell people. So Julia has kindly offered to share some information with us after they have a strategic planning conversation tomorrow and we'll make sure you all get that. Um, and after that, Olivia, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Great, Please. great. So many of you, Mark and I know, um, but for those who don't know us, we run a little um, boutique fundraising firm called Sea Change Strategies, and we really focus on um, maximizing organizations' capacity to raise money from individuals. We've had the pleasure of working one-on-one -on -one with many of you and in groups with many of you, and for those who don't know us, um, we're very informal. We like to keep this casual, and uh, we'll have a good time over the next hour or so. Um, this is the first um, experience share workshop um, in the series and we have um, asked Julia and Ileana to join us today to really share um, their learnings about what's working in terms of major donor outreach and we'll even talk about how subjective the term major donor is um, when we talk with them and, and really the, the origin of this series um, came about because Mark and I were doing coaching with each of you and we just recognized how much wisdom there is in the collaborative, right? And so rather than have us say, okay, here's how you do it, we really wanted to harness the energy and the wisdom and the expertise of folks within this network. And so that's what we're doing today. Um, as far as future experience share workshops, um, there will be three more. They're listed here for the purposes of today. I won't go through them each, but definitely watch for Jasmine's emails so you can RSVP, particularly if you find this one helpful. Um, I, think, uh, I think we'll have lots of good conversations. In terms of today's agenda, um, I'm going to provide some brief um, context, maybe five minutes, 
And then Ileana and Julia are gonna take it away and really share what's popping for them. Um, please chat in your questions. Um, and then Mark is gonna lead a Q&A um, for the remainder of the time. And if you have experience you wanna share um, about your um, expertise in this area, we welcome that too. We'll play all that by ear. All right, so I know this is a lot of text here, but I just thought it, you know, like Debbie said, we've all heard the word challenging over and over this year. And I am a very donor-centric fundraiser, and so I really value research and keeping a pulse. I know how I'm feeling, and I'm really tired. <laughs> I don't know about you all. Um, but as we're talking with donors, as we're engaging donors, I think it's really important for us to constantly be listening to, to donors. And um, one of the most recent studies that I've seen that I wanted to share um, is a group of uh, direct response individual giving donors um, this was done by a, a research firm that I really respect called OG. And just very, very quickly, I want to give you a pulse of what they found in terms of donors who are likely to give to your organization. Now, this is a national sample, so it's not regional or state specific, but it gives you kind of an aggregate view of how donors across the country are feeling, donors to progressive causes. So almost half of them um, think the worst of the pandemic is yet to come. So they're bracing for a rocky few months ahead. When it comes to whether people are more concerned about health or more concerned about economics, 64% say they are more concerned about health. And then um, the other percentage said that they're more um, concerned about the impact of the economy. So as you're communicating with donors, just remember that, that many of them are really scared for their health and the health of people in their families. Okay, so something to remember. Donors are personally financially optimistic, right? They're much more confident about their own economic future than about the economy as a whole. So 58% feel very or somewhat confident about their own personal finances versus 31% for the general economy. So you might be hearing, oh, the economy is going on a roller coaster. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't ask donors for support, but you need to recognize that they're bracing for the worst to be yet ahead, and they're really concerned about their own health. There is a resilient mid-level and major donor. And I think this is really important for today's conversation. Um, once you get above donors who give 150 to donors who give 250 and above, they're much more confident about their own economic future. 75% of them are confident versus 55% of them being confident about the overall economy. And I think it's really important for us as fundraisers to know that the intention to giving is stronger than to, to keep giving is stronger than ever, right? Donors have really doubled down in terms of how much they feel called to give. Um, it's particularly strong amongst this donor group, mid-level and major donors. 73% of donors are confident they will continue giving, and 84% of mid-level donors are confident they're going to continue giving. And 55% of those mid-level donors are very confident. So there's like a, a passion um, underscoring their intensity to give. Um, so I thought that that would be just helpful in grounding us about where donors are feeling. Now, I do want to say this survey fielded um, in mid-June. So it's about a month old. And usually research can withstand a month. Um, in these very chaotic times, um, you know, I, I do want to just give you a caveat that this fielded a month ago. It did field after the George Floyd protests. So we are at least in that era of 2020. Um, but it is likely to change and, and important for you to just keep, keep your pulse out. Okay, so that's the overall perspective. Let's just take a very quick look at um, major giving um, in terms of how it belongs in your fundraising um, strategy. So everyone probably has seen something like this, right? This is the individual fundraising giving pyramid. 
It starts out at the bottom because nobody gives to an organization they've never heard of, right? So you've got your brand awareness. Then they get used to you. They sign up to hear from you. They hear one of your program experts speak. Um, some friend tells them that they need to come to an event, right? They get warm. Then they give you a donation. Then ideally they become a mid-level donor. And then magically they become major donors and leave all of their money to you in their will, right? This is how it's supposed to work. Um, it doesn't necessarily do so in real life as we all know, but it's a beautiful structure to take a look at. Now, for the purposes of this conversation, there's another way that you can look at this pyramid. Because if you look at the potential income, right, the pyramid really is inverted. And the lion's share of individual fundraising dollars typically comes from majors and bequests, monthly, mid-level, one-off donors, and down, right? So this is why we really wanted to start the series with a conversation about major donors, because a small number of donors drive the most income, right? The top Owners, 35% of revenue, and the top 20% generate 80% of revenue, typically within organizations that we work at, right? So that's why we're here today. Am I the only one for whom Aliyah has frozen? No, you're no, she's frozen for me too. <laughs> Ooh, and now there she is. She's frozen. I can't hear anything. Hello. You're back. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Great. Great time for my internet to go out, right? Can you hear me? I'm gonna stop my video. Can folks hear me now? Yep. Yeah. Okay, clear. Then I got off video and we're just going to make that work. Seeing my dog right now. <laughs> okay, great. You're seeing a, a yellow pyramid? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Mark, I might need you to, to jump in. <laughs> okay. Um, Aaliyah, as, as Aaliyah said, it's a very small number of donors who are probably driving the, the vast majority of your income, which is why we've kicked off by talking about major gifts. And Aaliyah also implied correctly that um, it's not a linear stepwise thing for the most part where someone goes up slowly up the pyramid. People often will come in at a higher level um, or they'll go from making a $15 gift to, to making a major gift. Um, Aliyah, I see your box lit up. Did you want to come no, in? No, I, 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 I think I'm back. Let's see if this works. And I'm almost done anyway. So yes. And then just adding what Mark was saying, 50% um, of your major donors often come from the low dollar file. Right, so um, I think Julia and Ileana are going to talk to this, but when I say low dollar donor, I really don't mean that pejoratively, right? Someone who gives, um, you know, a, a small donation who stays with you for a long period of time could be considered a major donor for you. Um, and we're gonna talk about that in a second, but that's really what the um, you just never know where your, um, you know, fountains of support are going to come from. Now, the thing is, is that major donors do tend to require high touch stewardship. And many of these stewardship opportunities have been disrupted. Um, events, one on one meetings, board meetings and coffees are no longer viable. So what are we supposed to do? And that is where I want to hand it over to Ileana and Julia. Um, and please chat in questions. And Mark, I'm gonna ask that you take the lead on the audio from here and just know that I'm here supporting in chat. Okay, um, Ali, if you could turn off your screen share, I can keep an eye on people and an eye on the chat. And 
if you've got any questions that have come up so far, like um, pro most of you are probably wondering how to, how to define mid-level or major gifts, and that'll get covered. But um, anything on your minds, um, please chat it in, because uh, we want to make time for, for your questions to get answered. All right, Ileana. Julia, do your thing. So um, I will start off just by saying that last week, Julia and I got a chance to connect and sort of compare notes about what we wanted to share with you today. Um, and two things really stood out to me from that conversation. One is how similar um, similar and different our approaches have been to um, you know, fundraising this year. Uh, one of the things that we both really focused primarily on is stewardship and creating space for really just like genuine human react uh, interactions with our followers and supporters and donors. Um, so, you know, we've done that in some different ways. We'll talk about those, but I just wanted to acknowledge that that's a really similar approach that we've both taken. Um, and then also this idea of like, what is a major donor? Um, at NC Child, we technically will define a major donor as anyone who makes a gift of $250 or more. Um, we also, you know, consider people who donate um, their time and their treasure um, to be, you know, sort of equal. And, you know, anyone who's um, been a monthly supporter for multiple years or has made consistent annual gifts over multiple years, we also consider that to be important. But for the purposes of, of our fundraising plan, we define a major donor as someone who gives $250 or more. Um, so, you know, with that framework just set, I'll also share that um, I came on staff at NC Child last February. And when I came on staff, one of the things that was priority number one was looking for ways to diversify our um, contributed income. At the time, we were bringing in something like 95% of our contributed income from grants and foundations. And so as we're looking to the future and knowing that the economy was going to be uncertain, we really wanted to diversify because that's just smart financial planning, right? Um, and so we were, we happened to be doing strategic planning at the time. And so I was able to work with Aaliyah to create this really amazing three year fundraising plan that was going to dovetail with our organization's strategic plan and support our growth in a sustainable way. We were going to fo focus on diversifying that individual contribution revenue and um, our contributed income. And we're really going to focus on the ways that we could do that, the, the, the smartest ways possible. Um, we ended the year with a really, you know, great end of year campaign. Um, we're really like totally stoked about jumping into fundraising in 2020. And then just as we were about to start, you know, setting our first like cohort of um, scheduling our first, first cohort of like donor meetings, COVID happens. So, um, you know, while some of my colleagues were like going to Costco and hoarding disinfectant spray, spray I was like, calling my wine rep on the phone and I was like, how soon can you do curbside delivery? I need help. Um, but, you know, we really just were grieving this year that we knew was going to be difficult because of the elections and because of the economic, possible economic downturn. But we weren't really thinking that we were going to like totally have to start over from ground zero. Um, so after a little bit of grieving, what we realized, and we had some good conversations with staff about pivoting to COVID-19 response, is that our donors weren't going to go anywhere unless we made them go away, and that the work wasn't going to go anywhere because it was still going to be important. And so we were just going to have to approach this fundraising plan with a little bit of flexibility. Um, so we did two things from the very beginning. Um, the first thing we did, because I had already been sort of in the... Um, in the work of doing our annual uh, impact report, um, we pared that down to bare bones, made it really a thank you and showing um, you know, our donors what the impact of their gift was on our work. And we also packaged that with a one page COVID-19 response that basically said like, we're not going anywhere. We love you, we appreciate you. Please help us get through the next couple of months because who knows what's gonna happen on the other side. So we sent that out and that was basically the first 
the big communication that we had with any of our supporters for the year for 2020. Um, so we did that. We also did a survey to all of our people. So we sent this out to our entire list just to check in. And we asked them questions like, similar to what um, Aaliyah shared in that survey that she just um, you know, went over with all of us, like questions about you know, what folks were worried about, what folks were you know, thinking about for the future, what concerns did they have, how could we support them, how likely were they, were they to give. And we didn't get a huge response. We got less than 100 responses, but it still showed us some really positive stuff. Um, what we were seeing from those responses was a lot of, you know, we're still here for you. Let us know how we can support you. We'll get in touch if we have questions. And so that made us feel good. Um, and then the next thing that we did, which we are still doing, and it's been sort of the focus of all of our um, donor outreach for this year so far, was I literally made a spreadsheet of every single person who's given to NC Child in the last year. Um, and we started at the top and just started reaching out to people and having one-on-one -on -one conversations with folks. So every day I would send our director her two contact list people for the day and ask her to either call them or email them. Not making any requests, not making any like solicitations, not even talking about their gift other than just to thank them. Um, but really just encouraging us to have really personal conversations with folks. And we got a lot of really great responses from people when we started doing that. Um, you know, folks would write back and say, thank you so much for like asking me how I'm doing. My kid is crying. The dog wants to go out. The cat is like puking on my laptop right now. My partner's asking me what's for dinner when there's a refrigerator full of food and they know how to cook too. Like, you know, you're the only person right now who's actually asking me how I'm doing and I appreciate that so much. So, you know, fast forward to now um, and that's really the only donor outreach that we've done. We've had zero major donor meetings in the sense that, you know, we're having like one-on-one -on -one conversations with folks asking them to renew their gift. We haven't done any of that yet. So it's July, it's, you know, halfway through the year. Um, and somehow we're still meeting our fundraising goals. And I know it's because we're doing this really intentional relationship building work with stuff. Um, you know, part of our plan for this year you know, looking at our major donor giving, um, you know, in 2019, we raised $119,000 from um, individuals. And about 90 of that came from folks who we consider major donors. So for this year, uh, we wanted to increase that. And um, we know that, you know, we have about 56 people in our portfolio who we consider to be major donors, you know, giving $250 or more. So we decided we wanted to increase that and um, by 10% ish. So, you know, for this year, we wanted to have five of our major existing major donors increase their gifts. We also wanted to bring in five new major gifts from folks who either were brand new to us, you know, prospects that a board member introduced us to, or maybe there was someone on our list who um, was giving at a lower level. We wanted five of those folks to become major donors. Well, it's July. Like I said, we've had zero major donor meetings and we've already done both of those things. So just really focusing on that human connection, showing people that we care, that we're still here doing the work, that their gift still matters, they still matter to us as people. That is what has been working for us. Interestingly, when we've asked folks if, you know, we've just now gotten through the end of that list and we're starting to think about what the next steps are for folks, and you know we're experimenting with asking people if they want to do like a virtual coffee or if there's a way to do a socially distanced um, you know donor meeting with them, and they're not saying yes to that. You know people are tired of Zoom. At least our folks are very tired of Zoom. They don't want to have to do anything extra. We're getting a lot of um, oh I know you guys are still doing the stuff. Why don't you just send me a proposal and I'll get back to you. Last week I got a thank you so much for checking in. No, we don't want to have a meeting. We are totally tired of Zoom. I just went ahead and told our, um, you know, the person at, at the community foundation to go ahead and send you your check. So it's making things easier for us and it's making things easier for our donors. And all we're really doing is focusing on them as people. Um, 
And I think that's just really powerful, you know, cause the, you know, the, it's getting back to those basic like fundraising best practices, right? Like we all know we shouldn't be treating our donors like ATMs. We all know that we should be, you know, fostering human connection and like really showing people what the connection is between them and our staff and the work and the mission and how that all works together for us to be able to do good work together. Um, but you know, best practices are built for times like these because when everything's great and the economy is wonderful and you know donors are like banging down your door to meet with you so they can give you checks, it can be easy to get a little lazy. You know, if you forget to follow up with someone or God forbid you spend like spell someone's name wrong on a program and you know they never want to give you money again likely there are two or three people waiting in the wings that you can sort of like cultivate and get them, you know, into your, your donor portfolio. Um, but now, you know, I think that's different. Um, folks are feeling different ways about, um, you know, the economy and their own personal finances. And so it's not the time to be taking folks for granted. And it really, for us, has shown a lot of, um, return on our investment when we invest in our donors as people. So um, that's really been working for, that's really what's been working for us. And I wish we could, I could say that we've done all this crazy experimenting, we're doing all these virtual events and we're like, you know, trying all this stuff on for size. But honestly, we are just talking to people and it is, it like gives me goosebumps to think about like how meaningful that is for folks. Eliana, I think Aliyah and I both found um, what you shared very quotable. Aliyah has shared in the in the chat um, your point that it's worth the investment when we invest in donors as people. And I wrote down best practices were made for times like this, which I think is also super wise. So thank you for that. Yeah. Um, Julia. Thank you, and thank you. Um, I can reiterate, like I said, we had a conversation earlier um, and I think we both sort of approached this from that same lens of, you know, the, the human centered connection, the investment into the relationship. So I don't want to repeat all of that because I think you stated it beautifully. Um, and in our conversation, we really wanted to try to also bring to the table some of um, building on that. That's kind of the foundational. This is the approach that you take with all those things. And then there is space. Um, that we have approached these from a little bit of different ways. Um, our, our organizations and all of our organizations are in different places with our fundraising. Um, but I would say it's probably a fair assessment that there's a little bit of um, a struggle in, in individual fundraising for our child advocacy organizations because of the type of work that we do, right? We all, we, we all, all of our pod calls, all of our conversations with each other really get down to like, oh my gosh, how do we, how do we start expanding that base and how do we do all of those things? And so in addition to really viewing our um, major donors as, you know, that human relationship and appreciating them and building those relationships, we also really tried to view them as ambassadors um, to make it really easy for them to help communicate out the things that have so much value about our organizations right now that surprisingly have been landing so well with people. Um, our organization, when I came on board, we were in the midst of a lot of organizational change to begin with. Um, and so when COVID happened, we, one of the things that I think that we did very well was we were able to narrative shift to find where do we fit within this new world? Why are we still, we don't do direct service, right? And I think that's a very big challenge when you don't have a huge pool of people, right? We are, we are I, I'm in that 56 range same as you, if I have about that number that give 250 or more, but they all kind of are tangentially connected to the work and to the foundations and to other groups that maybe do support in other ways financially that um, was really important for them to hear where we belong in this larger COVID scheme. And so we started speaking in these one-on-one -on -one conversations in our grants in our donor advice letters, even to the importance of full child advocacy organizations being here for equitable recovery. You know, that, you know, when we're talking about not tomorrow, we don't do direct service. And I know Mark, you would disagree with me. We go back and forth on this. There is a place for food and security and no, no child hungry does really well right now, but how do we as child advocacy organizations that work in policy also stay relevant was something we spent a lot of time really upfront thinking about. Um, 
and opening up those conversations that were those fears that people have. They feel like, you know, they feel financially secure, but there's an awareness, I think, that has never been there before of that's not going to be true for everybody. And, you know, fear of child abuse, fear of food insecurity, fears of all those things. Um, was really interesting to kind of hear how our major donors, which are a lot of our board members and a lot of our partner organizations are really having these conversations about long term, which is where we really play a lot of that, that role in ensuring that children are prioritized when we're making decisions, when there's going to be less money, when we're trying to force these issues forward. And so that I think was just a really interesting um, thing that we shifted to really quickly uh, that that, land, that landed, Mark, we've had these conversations. And so with that lens, uh, we decided we were gonna go for Giving Tuesday now. I don't know how many of you all participated in that. That was shockingly successful for us to see our, um, it was new, I Give Lively as a platform that I've just discovered that's free, that can help you do campaign based. I'd never used it before. Giving, you know, we hadn't do, done any online fundraising and, you know, it was, it, that kind of messaging was landing and we were like, you know what, let's just see what happens and put it out to our major donors to say, can you share this? So we ended up raising, I think almost $2,000 for something. I didn't know what was gonna happen. Our major donors gave early and some of our major donors actually doubled their donation through that and shared with their, their networks and their communities in a very surprising and really, um, really inspiring way to make me think, okay, let's do more of this, um, this style of communication. And so we went ahead with that kind of same frame and messaging uh, and sent a letter to all the donor advised fund groups that we knew. So we sent it to the foundations that had donor advised. I don't know how many of you have kind of those community based foundations that also hold donor advised funds. We just went ahead and sent it to them and sent them this letter and say, hey, here's where we are. We want to be part of prioritizing children as we don't know what's going to happen, but here, you know, but we feel like we need to be here. And this is very different. We know people care about food insecurity deeply, but care about the long term. And we, you know, I don't think we didn't jump through relationship hoops in those spaces. We actually just got checks from two different organizations that we had, that had never supported us before in pretty high amounts. That was surprising too. And I think it was really just we we just started to put stuff out there, put out our voice, put out our. Um, you know, our need to stay, to stay route, to be here long-term uh, and whether or not that works in every space, um, I don't know, but it all is under that um, kind of foundational piece that Eliana spoke to about that. We've made space for those conversations. We've been doing that interconnectedness. So then when we did take this kind of experimental steps, we saw the returns really come in on that. Um, and so now we're thinking about other ways to um, bring that to the table. I will say we also put some fun into some of the things that we're doing. I think people, you, we, we are an opportunity for people to be connected to something that's greater than them in a time where there's no connection and there's a lot of fear. And so we try to have that, that little bit of fun factor still play in so that it's not so heavy all the time. So we did in conjunction with these asks, we've tried to incorporate like this new video that we have coming out. Hey, come, come see our video. Um, you know, and help us stay relevant so we can prioritize children. So those are the things within um, the actionable areas that we've really tried to figure out now that those relationships, those conversations, all those things are happening. What do we do with that? How do we take that? And best practices are best practices for a reason. If you do nothing but have conversations with the people that are loyal to you, that support you, it's going to, you know, you're going to get the results that you're looking for in that way. Um, but I think this is an interesting time to see how do you make things a little bit, um, you know, how do you take some risk right now, um, knowing that there might not be a return on that right now, but even at that low, like going all the way back to that brand awareness level, there's opportunities to sort of create that, um, to, to see major donors come into play in the future. So um, the, plat the platforming, the campaign based, um, just the outreach, best practices, letters, direct, direct mail appeals, individual thank you phone calls, all of those things have really just come together. And we have also met um, you know, our, our goals in a way that I was very excited to see re return on, an, on very limited investment and, and prioritizing 
that we can and being transparent about the things that we're just not going to do everything amazingly well right now because we don't have capacity and because we've had those conversations about where we are and what we want to try that, that expectation has really kind of been broken where these donors see us as partners and they're along for this experimental journey um, in a way that i don't think we've engaged with them before so um, i think that that's definitely uh, been something surprising and inspiring that helps us um, feel comfortable knowing that there's a lot of unknowns. Thank you, Julia. It, it's amazing how sticking to the basics has served both of you well. And that's definitely one theme that, that's coming out of this. Um, Ilya, did you want to add anything before um, we start taking questions from your um, co Community, you're on mute. No, I'm excited to answer some questions. I've talked a lot. Okay. Um, I'm going to go in order that the questions have come up. The first one came in from Tiffany Tyler Garner, who I'm going to go out on a limb and guess is the partnership's newest ED. Um, Tiffany, you're welcome to come off mute and ask the question yourself, or I can read it. It's entirely up to you. All right. <laughs> um, I will take that hand signal as I should read it. Considering the ratio of giving from major donors, is it fair to say that it's typical to have a small number of core donors comprise most of an organization's budget, even though we strive for diversification? Um, Ali and I both said yes, but I'm really curious what the experience, Ileana and Julia, of yours has been and, and the experience of anyone else Who's, who's part of the workshop today? Um, I'll share that, um, you know, I, I think I gave you all the total that in 2019, 90 of our $150,000 that we raised from individuals came from major donors. Um, and of that 90, there are two donors who made up $40,000 of that. Yeah. So I think that's typical for some for organizations of our size and um, you know, with the number of donors, like total donors, not even just major donors, but total donors in our portfolio. And I've seen that in other organizations where I've worked too. Um, so you know, knowing that and knowing that if one of those you know, 20,000 or $40,000 do donors goes away, that it's gonna be harder to make that up from one person. It really is important to have your fundraising strategy um, such that you're really cultivating and bringing those folks along who are giving less. And that's really part of what this outreach has been doing for us is giving us like an opportunity to, to talk to folks who are in the lower um, tiers of our portfolio. And those are some of the folks who we've seen um, increase their gifts at NC Child or become new major donors. Um, and I think that's happening because we're giving, we have the opportunity right now to give them a little bit more attention and show them how much that um, their gift can impact our work. Julia? So I think my background is probably a little bit different. I would say yes. Um, typically, uh, you know, and this gets into some interesting equity questions that I will not go into, uh, but my, my background also ha uh, tends to be more in community-based and community-led organizations, which really changes the demographics of what do we mean by major donors and um, when you're looking at, and I know, and I know we do have some, some partnership organizations whose major donor base is the community itself. Um, typically you, you do see that. I think that there are ways um, to, to balance that if, like Ileana said, with a pretty diversified fundraising strategy. But really, I think you, you, you then start spending a lot of time with, it, with the specific community that's impacted by the work that you're doing that becomes your major donor base without that high number, without the high dollar sign attached to those major donors. But that really depends on sort of your, the demographic of what your donor portfolio looks like. So traditionally, yes, that's true with it, but I wanted to qualify that, but that's not always true because I think it's very much dependent on who, who you serve and who you reach out to and who you are spending your time cultivating. And, and that's a conversation that I think is going to become louder and more prevalent in the, in the coming months and, and is probably overdue. The other footnote I would add is 
as Ileana pointed out, you can't, yes, it's a small handful that may be generating a high percentage, but you can't take them for granted and you need to keep the pipeline going at the same time. So you can't ignore your, your lower dollar donors. Anyone else from the workshop want to chime in? You could just go ahead and unmute yourself or we'll go on to the next question, which is an interesting one. All right, I'm gonna go on to the next question. And this is about Zoom fatigue, and I'm really curious about this too. Um, Jesse, do you wanna come off mute and um, ask your question, or do you want me to read it? I can ask it. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Jesse from Kentucky Youth Advocates. Um, and you can probably hear my four-year-old in the background. But, um, so yeah, we're in the middle of starting a plan for um, a major donor coffee which I got at a previous um, one of these. <laughs> but like I heard that idea like six weeks ago and then we didn't do anything about it. And then we were like, oh, let's do one of those with a date for like a couple weeks from, a few weeks from now. Um, so we haven't sent out invites. We've set the date. Um, and now I'm wondering is there enough Zoom fatigue that we should just be like, scrap this and start making phone calls? So that was my thoughts. I'm interested in everyone's thoughts on that. May I respond? Please. So um, I think Zoom fatigue is real, but I also think it depends on what the reason is that you're calling folks together and what the purpose of the gathering is. Um, we have not had a lot of great luck with trying to ask folks to have like one-on-one -on -one meetings with us as staff. Um, but we've held, while our legislature was in session, we were holding regular Friday Zoom update calls that were really geared towards people who are like us, you know, um, people within the advocacy network who um, wanted to come together and learn information from each other. So those are hugely successful for, for us. So we have those every Friday and every Friday, I mean, we actually had to up our Zoom capacity a couple of times because we were getting so many people wanting to join those calls, but they were really hyper-focused on policy updates. So folks who were dialed into that um, need were really served well by those calls. Um, and I would scan the participant list and see that, the, like we would have donors attend those because a lot of our donors are people who work alongside us, um, which is probably similar to a lot of you. Um, and then this Thursday, we're actually hosting another version of one of those policy update calls where two of our staff experts are going to share um, the results basically of our legislative agenda for this year and then talk a little bit about what's left to come for the rest of 2020. We sent that invite out to 30 of our top most invested donors and we have 10 of them showing up on Thursday. So I feel like that's actually a pretty good response. Um, we're not doing like informal coffee meetings. Um, I know that there is at least one other person named Michael Brown on this call who has been doing more informal donor meetings and maybe he could be encouraged to share what his experience has been with those. Um, but you know, I think you just have to you have to invite folks to do it. And if you don't get a good response, then don't do it. And if you do, then you do. Michael, you've been invited to uh, speak to you. Sorry to put you on the spot, but I know that you've done these. Oh, really honor. I really appreciate it. Just fast. <laughs> Um, yeah, we've been doing a lot of, we've been, uh, by the way, I'm Michael Brown with Voices for Virginia's Children, and um, it's been great to hear all of this information, I guess, coming out from everyone, and we're very similar in our approach in, in terms of what we're, what, uh, what Ileana is doing, and we, we have been, have tried very hard to be as informal as possible. We know that this is a very tough time. We, I actually don't have a lot of Zoom calls with people. It's more, it's more via email. It's more, um, it's more telephone. Just because I know, um, I don't know about you all. I hate Zoom because stuff freezes up and it's just there's, there's a delay. There's all sorts of fun stuff. So I'd rather get stuff in real time. Um, it's great to see people's faces and everything, and I think that's great. And, and don't mind that, but. We've been, you know, we've been really focused on just having a quick five-minute call, like a five-minute check-in. How you doing? How your kids doing? How's all that, all that stuff doing? And we're getting to the point now where we're starting to make asks, 
and we're, we're doing it very strategically in the fact that we're doing it um, in three, and we're asking them three different things. We're asking them to recommit at a major giving level. We're asking them to give more and increase their gift, and we're asking them to give sooner. And so I, I, like that sort of approach has actually worked very, very well. We're actually looking to exceed our goals this year, too. So just keeping a really informal um, and formal uh, communication plan with our donors is has been best case. I've gotten all of our board members to send out thank you notes. Um, I've even asked just to see pictures of dogs or something like getting people to email me those types of uh, things just so that we can think about something other than the crisis. And it's it, it just kind of humanizes people in, in, in a different way and kind of builds a bond that's, that's a little bit greater with our donors. So that's kind of what we've been doing. I think you're. I think your experience I, underscores the fact that, in, in many respects, the touch um, is more important than the content of of the connection. I'm not saying don't pay attention to it, but but people remember that you reached out. Liliana, I think I cut you off. No, I think you, Mary. This oh, is Mary Coogan. I wanted, to, yeah, I wanted to ask a follow up. Sorry, I called in. I couldn't zoom in. Um, in terms of uh, the policy updates that you're doing, could is there a certain time of day people are finding people are more amenable? Are you keeping it to like an hour? I mean, this is it's been really helpful both of your presentations, but I was just curious because I think if you got ten, a third of the people saying they're interested, that's great. We were doing them at eleven o'clock on Fridays, so we had a standing time, and that's been established for us. We've done those Friday calls um, when the legislature is in session for multiple years. So that's sort of something that people expect from us. Um, but we started doing them earlier this year because of COVID. So we use them as an opportunity to like share our COVID-19 response and resources with our networks. Um, so I think just like being consistent about it was really helpful for us. Okay. Do people think it would be worth it to ask people whether mornings, afternoons, lunchtime is a better time or just try to schedule something and see how it goes. Julia? I would just schedule it and see how it goes. I think the, the least amount of thinking possible for people. Um, I feel like overcomplicated anything that requires anything more than like, oh, could I show up to this is too far for me to think about myself. I'm like, I don't know what my child's going to be doing in the next three hours, much less like in the next three weeks. So I think it's really being comfortable with the fact that if you schedule, you know, if you build it, they will come kind of concept um, and being okay if they don't would be, you know, and I, I mean, I guess I would also say, in, is it in addition to sort of those personal connections too? Because if I think if you need to prioritize phone calls and that connection versus trying versus this, if you only have capacity for one, I would definitely pick up the phone and make those touches versus spending your time trying to like organize conversations personally. I would agree yeah. with that. Right. And also, you know, if you want to look at it as an opportunity to maybe just pull a couple of your major give, major gift givers or a couple of really VIP folks for you, you know, there's always like the other best practice, ask for advice and you'll get a donation. You know, you could, you could use that to your favor if you wanted to just um, bring in a small group of folks to help you, you know, think through what that could look like for your folks. That's great. That's great. Um, Julia, this next question, which also comes from Tiffany, is right up your alley. And I'm going to give you first crack at it. Um, when the nature of the pandemic inherently reinforces the need for direct client services, how are you underscoring the role advocacy must play during this time and enlisting the support of others? And I just want to give Julia credit for knowing when to ignore her consultant um, to her success. Uh, you know, I think that this was, um, a, you know, a really difficult conversation for us to have as an organization. I think we've, we've all had I, you know, we personally, and Mark has been pretty heavily involved in the moral gra grappling with how do we, how do we ask for money when there's so much need to getting things like basics 
um, to provide direct services. And so I think where we really landed um, with, with underschooling the need for advocacy is that, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the reasons that we're in this position, a lot of the reasons that there's such a need for this is because we were not in a place with a strong social safety net, that the systems were held together with bubble gum and that that has led us to this place where we, we now are struggling to get basic resources, particularly like diapers and food and schools are required to be open just so kids can eat. And you know that that, that inherently is not gonna go away without some very major systems change. And in order for that to be, in order for those changes to happen, whole child advocacy organizations need to be part of that voice, about a part of that future, driving the changes forward, advocating on the federal level, the state level, the local level, to make sure that if, if something, when, you know, we say it's unprecedented and it's like now more than ever, and I'm like, you know, there is precedent for this. You know, like we knew, we all knew that if we were to be in this situation that we had really low, like really like low capacity to support anything other than the bare minimum of, you know, we can barely keep kids in houses and kids fed without a pandemic. And so we really, you know, talked about how there's such a huge need for that advocacy role in recovery to be part of that equation. And that seems to land with people, the understanding that we want to be part of making sure this doesn't happen. The next emergencies, crises, they're going to happen and we're going to have less. There's econ the economic recovery issue. You know, how do we help prioritize where that money goes so that we don't ensure that those who have already been left behind are even farther away from that, from that gap. And a lot of it plays into our personal organizational approach to systems change. Um, prioritizing equity, understanding that blanket universal approaches to resource investments are not going to fix the things that are fundamentally flawed about our system. And for donors, because I think a lot of them, um, if you're like us, live in this kind of policy wonky world a lot also, a lot of them are lobbyists, a lot of them are partner organizations, um, and a lot of them are just people who deeply care, deeply, deeply care about children. Um, people are seeing things from a new perspective and there's a voice and a role for us in that that's landing. So hope, I don't know how helpful that is, but we, we've, I have some messaging and some kind of ways that we've tried to communicate that. I'm happy to share the language that we've used um, without trying to take away from the fact that there is immediate need to. Uh, Aaliyah, you had a follow-up question. Do you want to come off mute and ask it or do you want me to read it? Let me see, and uh, Mike, Michael, I feel you on Zoom freezing up. So apologies to everyone. Um, Julia, I think, you know, I think you made such a strong case for giving. Do you also see like there being a why now moment? Because now's the time when we're seeing these fundamental flaws and it's when decision makers are being held accountable, right? Because we're seeing them. So there's almost like, you know, advocacy has to has to have kind of a first move um, advantage right now because we might lose the momentum. Absolutely, uh, and you know, and I think that there are some things, and that thing, you know, thank you to Debbie and the partnership. There's always things coming out to share information and share resources to drive issues. You know, a lot of it we do know we do know what we need to do, and we lack the political will to some degree to get those changes to be made and I think people are really resonating with like yeah absolutely something needs to change it uh, people are inspired people are are ready for you know if, and particularly in you know Oregon obviously we live in an incredibly charged environment right now even more than when we started with the pandemic which I think just really drives um, some of the advocacy we we made a choice to support police police accountability in a special session here in Oregon. Like that was our, our, our choice of advocacy role. And we made that well known to our donors and our funders and said, you know, absolutely. Like we want to be a, a driver of, of how the racism impacts children, all these things, these impact child well-being, And you need to start thinking about this from an interconnected lens that we got way less pushback from all of our major donors that had traditionally mentally lived in white spaces whose people's minds are opening up. And so if we don't drive through that gap right now as, you know, as organizations and bring our donors along with us to say like, you can be part, if the world's gonna change with or without you, you can be part of driving that change forward and really helping children. Um, I think it's a missed opportunity. So 
kind of harness, harnessing the passion of, of people to create change right now um, is, the good, is a strategy that works for us. But it doesn't work, let me just preface it, it doesn't work without those personal touch conversations either, right? You know, we had a meeting with our board about what, what we were gonna support and it was a happy hour that turned into like a two hour conversation about equity, right? You know, and personal, you know, just different perspectives and conversations. And so I think with, I don't know that the, the narrative and the things that I'm talking about work without that fundamental strong foundation of relationship building. I think that's a really, really strong caveat. We are running down on time, but I wanted to cover Jesse's follow-up um, saying she was planning a Zoom event um, for the donors because they're already good at doing Zoom events for advocates. This has me wondering if we should retool or cancel that event. Um, I'm gonna throw in my two cents. If it's already a strength of the organization, um, I wouldn't necessarily shy away from it. And I think Zoom fatigue isn't gonna last forever. It's, you know, I'm sure there was telephone fatigue in the early days of the telephone. Um, and there's not a lot of alternatives right now. So um, if you've got something compelling and relevant, I, yeah. I would be hesitant to cancel. Aaliyah? And that, it's funny because I wrote in, I think that's worth considering, Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> and, and from my perspective, just because it works with one audience doesn't mean it will work with another. So it, I think Mark is totally valid and it shows how subjective fundraising is. Um, but, you know, it, I think it's also a good check. Like, are we doing this because we know it works with advocates and we haven't really done the personalized touches to our donors? that we need to do? Are we doing it as it, as an easy out from like doing the heavy lifting, the personal touches, et cetera? So, you know, that's, that's my take on it. I really like what you said, Aaliyah. It absolutely can't substitute for the one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. That's a really, really great point. Aaliyah, I'm gonna let you bring it on home and talk about the next um, sessions that we're planning. Well, I just am so thrilled um, how this went. And I'm so thankful to Julia and Ileana for their time. Um, this wouldn't have been possible without the two of them agreeing to a share. And I wanna thank everyone who was on this call. There's so much wisdom. There's so much insight in community. And I think um, connecting to that is going to be our strength. It's gonna be how we're gonna get on the other side of this. Um, in that spirit, there are three more workshops um, planned. Um, Mary Coogan, who chimed in with a question, is going to be joining Rebecca Ratz for our next one on Monday. Um, and then I've, I've texted in all of the others in the chat, and Jasmine will be sending them to you as well. Um, and we hope um, that you'll join us. And um, maybe everyone could um, just unmute themselves as you get off and, and thank our speakers, our sharers, for their time. Um, Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us. It was great. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, all. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.